You are very welcome back to the programme. Well, now I'm joined by a woman who started working in prostitution at the age of just 15 after a very difficult childhood. Amazingly, she managed to get out of it, get an education, and has now written a book that does deal with her own experiences, but arguably, more importantly, also deals with policy and issues around prostitution. She says the entire trade is a form of abusive sexual exploitation. Rachel Moran joins me now. Rachel, thank you very much for coming in uh, this morning. And, uh, you, you know, fair play to you writing this book and for going public. What, why did you decide to do that? Um, well, like I, I said just recently, um, it was very important for me to stand over my own truth. Um, I did consider using the pseudonym, of course, you know, given the, the nature of the book. But I just knew that I couldn't be at peace with that. There's, I, I just had to. I, I think this issue needs women to come forward publicly. And I see it kind of like... Um, you know, in times not too long ago, women couldn't talk about having breast cancer in polite society um, or being victims of domestic violence and so on and so forth. So I feel that if we're ever going to break the shame barrier and have women, um, you know, we, we need to start talking about commercial sexual exploitation publicly. And you describe it as a form of sexual abuse. Tell me why. Because unwanted sex is unwanted sex. And money, Even if you're being paid for it? Oh yes, and money doesn't have any kind of magical quality that can remove the feelings that you feel in yourself when you're having unwanted sex. Um, and I always make the comparison, if I was to hand somebody 20 quid and give them a smack in the mouth, that wouldn't do anything to take the sting out of the slap, you know? And I suppose uh, some people might say, well, there is a difference there in that a woman might offer herself for paid sex rather than offer herself for a slap in the mouth. You know, is there another side to that argument at all in your mind, Rachel? Well, no, because um, <laughs> the funny part about it is uh, receiving violence um, for money is part of prostitution. There's plenty of men out there who'll pay you to do exactly that. Mm. That's one thing you go into in the book, um, the difference between you know, regular men, if you like, and the cohort of men who will pay for sex. Mm -hmm. How do you define those men? Like, what, what is the difference between those groups of men? Well, thankfully, you, you cannot compare um, the general population of men with the cohort of men who pay for sex. Um, and thanks be to God, you can't, because I just, you know, you, you, the world would be a nightmare place to be if you could. Um, and what I mean by that, for example, is, let's say if you had a 15-year-old girl walking into um, a a private men's uh, club or you know a football club or somewhere where you had just all just men and uh, she was offering herself for sex the vast majority of men in the general population would not buy that girl for sex in fact they probably help her oh yeah and but with the the cohort of men who pay for sex um, I had my body used by hundreds and hundreds of them at 15 years of age and out of all of those men only one man turned around and brought me back down the street and, and, and argued all the way, was there not somewhere else he could drop me? Should I not be in school? Should I not be at home? And so on and so forth. So that was one man out of, I don't know how many, because I'm never going to sit down and do that calculation, although I could um, figure out a rough estimate. But, but what are the men like who pay for sex? Like, are there defining characteristics? I mean, because you, you've seen, I've seen them, you know, the baby chairs in the back, they're all, they look like normal men. What's different about them? They have a sense of sexual entitlement that gives them to believe that they have a right to buy what it is that they like. And that's what defines uh, them. It's the, their behaviour comes from the attitude. That's really... And Rachel, you believe that um, it, it, the law should change around prostitution, it, that the buyer of sex should be um, mm -hmm. penalised. Tell me about this. Well, I passionately believe that no person, be they man, woman or child, should ever be penalised or criminalised for their own exploitation. And I think that that's, that's pretty basic and should be pretty obvious. But it's so ingrained in our culture to blame the woman in this scenario that people just don't, they haven't woken up to that yet fully and they need to, they really do. And some countries have done it, I mean I know in the Nordic countries, but equally there are countries like Holland where they have legalised it. What impact has that had on the sex industry in those countries? Well, a massive proportion, the majority of the sex trafficking that comes through Europe, into Europe rather, comes through Holland for the reason that the sex industry over there has been legalised and normalised now for, for decades. And actually in the last year, certain politicians in Holland are talking about debating the Nordic model themselves because they haven't been able to control 
what has happened in their country. And over the last two years, they've shut down a massive amount of brothels and started regulating their opening hours and so on and so forth, because it, it has just been a scourge on, on the people of Holland. Yeah, and it's totally normalised the act of paying for sex, hasn't it? As, as well as well, it is. And I mean, one of the saddest things I ever saw was when I visited Holland a good, good many years ago and saw all these women sitting in the windows, like mm. as if they were merchandise on Grafton Street, and that really uh, that saddened me hugely. Yeah, it's very disturbing. That. Mm. What do you think the Irish government should do? I think that they should implement the Nordic model, um, which they're debating at the moment. And I think that they should make sure that they bring in um, one of the, the tenets of that model is exit strategies, real viable exit strategies for people who are in prostitution. Because you can't have one without the other. You can't expect to end demand without giving the people who are prostituted some other viable choice. A way out. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, Rachel, as I say, many congratulations. It's a really super book, Anna. Thank you very much. That, that is the book. Um, we'll just show you that paid for. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thank you.